no introduction would do justice to Sri Rajiv Malhotra's resolve and savor to the Dharmic community. His books, writings, speeches, interviews, and intellect has very deep impact on Hindus and Indologists worldwide. He has received the Ashirvad of intellectual giants of our time, including the Shankaracharyas of Sringeri, Puri, and Kanchipuram, Swami Chinmayananda Saraswati, Swami Dayananda Saraswati, the Dharma Acharya Sansad, Swami Ramdev, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, and many more. Verily, the Kataksha flow through him. I understand the magnitude of work that Rajivji has accomplished. Uh, to understand the magnitude of uh, work Rajivji has accomplished, let me put things in perspective. To uncover Russian collusion, the entire might of the US government is mobilized, involving hundreds of investigators, lawyers, the CIA, the FBI, and extraordinary amount of uh, money. Just imagine one person doing such an investigation, uncovering centuries of willful deceit, deception, digestion, and destruction of everything dharmic. The fact that we are meeting today to forge alliances and have a united intellectual front is the direct result of Rajivji's matchless tapasya, sadhana, and shraddha. In my opinion, introducing Rajivji is like to introduce one's own parents, grandparents, Diksha Guru, Siksha Guru, a debate coach, all rolled into one. For three decades, Rajivji has done fundamental research, invented countless tools, developed terms and strategies, and roadmaps to navigate what he terms the intellectual Kurukshetra. For example, the terms he introduced have found their way into the lexicon as more and more Dharmic historians try to find their voice to protest cultural genocide. Terms such as digestion, U-turn theory, intellectual colonization, history centrism, poison pills, Hindu phobia, and intellectual kshatriyata. Everything he, that he has done is for the greater good of the worldwide dharmic community. His message is simple, be bold and hold your own. Rajivji's books and writings are crisp and lucid. His seminal book, Being Different, is a combination of brilliant intellect and pure wisdom. Every page can be verbally weaponized and can be used in any intellectual debate. Rajivji's goal is to create a level playing field his book, Battle for Sanskrit, rattled the ivory towers of the Ivy Leagues of the world, exposing academic dishonesty, stunning duplicity, um, exposing these is time consuming, challenging, and very expensive. More than three million people worldwide follow Rajivji on Facebook. Our goal is to double that in 18 months. Using Facebook and YouTube, Rajivji has bypassed the gatekeepers to reach the intellectually hungry like all of us. He's the most popular author in India, barring cricket and Bollywood celebrity authors. <laughs> One more minute. Rajiji's energy and motivation are beyond normal. After days of a grueling trip to India, he readily agreed for a cross-country trip for a 30-minute meeting. He's the first to help us to understand the importance of civilizational studies and importance of grand narrative. His interviews and writings show the impact of civilizational studies on foreign policy, domestic policy, economics, soft power, education, and military strategy. His book, Breaking India, is a thousand times more complex than any collusion and political conspiracy you can think of. He exposed the intricate web of intellectually treasonous linkages. In this book, he went toe to toe with the multi-billion dollar church-financed conversion cancer and the left-wing's Hindu phobia
camouflaged as academic Hindu thought. <laughs> Lastly, from day one, Rajivji has set very high standards for himself and for all of us. Over the last 30 years, Rajivji has built a solid platform to forge Hindu and Dharmic unity through Sanskrit and Sanskriti. It is time we accelerate building consensus, bridging coalitions, and double our efforts. We must seize this great opportunity and support and complement the work he's been doing. Thank you, and it's join me to introduce, uh, invite Rajiji to the stage. Namaste. With uh, Raj's introduction, now I'll have even more enemies. But I'm so delighted I have friends like Dr. Swami to defend me also. <laughs> and all of you. And all of you. One of all the things he said, the one point I will say uh, that I, I agree with is that um, until two years ago, I must say, I always had this vulnerability that if I'm attacked, I won't get a chance to give my point of view because they'll block me, media won't let me give my point of view, and this one-sided thing goes viral, and then, you know, what do you do? But s since we successfully got into social media, particularly Facebook is what I'm focusing on. I think we've reached a critical mass where, quite honestly, for the first time, I'm just not worried, bothered, afraid what they say because we can hit right back. So, and for that, I thank all of you because so many of you have supported us in this. I want to uh, congratulate Sanskrit Bharati. First, I want to thank them because they've been a great friend for me in India. In so many cities, they hosted the launch of my book, Battle for Sanskrit, uh, and really did uh, good, uh, you know, justice to it in the way they analyzed it and sorted it out. And uh, we, we had a dinner meeting last night, just a private meeting with Sanskrit Bharati people here to discuss ways we can collaborate, and we came up with shortlisted three projects that we will think of doing together. So I think there's a lot of synergy between uh, the kind of work Infinity Foundation has been doing and Sanskrit Bharati. So I fully support their project to raise funds for an establishment in Washington. Sanskrit embedded within Sanskriti in India is a is well known, and I th I th all of you appreciate that. And Sanskriti as the foundation for Bharat is well understood. And that's a very important argument for the future of Sanskrit in India, the future of Sanskrit as for Bharatiya people. That's a, it's a very uh, important argument there. But what about United States? So I'm going to focus on that. What about we want to build a big center here near the capital? And so, how is it part of America is the issue. Now, the US is a nation of hyphenated identities. If you study the history of America, it's the history of immigrations, and the history of immigration is the history of how different immigrants come, and they hyphenate and become Americans. So we have it, Irish Americans, Italian Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Chinese Americans, Indian Americans, etc., etc., Jewish Americans, Muslim Americans. So people bring their identity and they are also American at the same time. It's a very unique kind of an American phenomenon. Europe hasn't discovered that. They are still experimenting. They haven't figured it out. So in the United States, there is nothing wrong if you are also a Bharatiya. There is absolutely no, no, nothing un-American about it and you must understand this process very well. A, an important education that our people, our leaders need 
is on the history of American identity formation. In fact, I have a manuscript about 500 pages I haven't published, but I, I finished writing it 15 years ago and just put it aside. I need to tidy it up and it's one of my unfinished books. And it's on the history of American identity formation and what Indians and Hindus can learn from it. There are a lot of resources built into American history and the American legal system and American culture where we can plug in and be able to get benefits out of it. For instance, there are things called historical societies. You can become a historical society and there are benefits for that. There are financial benefits for that. So I, w I don't want to go into too much detail on that aspect, but I, you can talk to me later on and I'll be happy to share with you. I want to talk about how all of that can benefit Sanskrit Bharati. So to define Sanskrit and Sanskriti in the American context is important. So young people, young Indians who come here, uh, or, or, or in, people who are born in this country, second generation, third generation Indians, you'll find that less of those percentage wise are going to temples. You'll find that most of the people who are going are first generation people, and so they have the links, they, their ecosystem of knowledge is the Indian, India-based Hinduism, and so that's how they're, they're continuing that, they're bringing that with them. But as generations go by, a larger percentage of our people will be born, raised here, second, third, fourth generation. So you have to see from their point of view, why should they bother with all this? That's a very important question we have not addressed successfully. Our leaders have not addressed successfully because you'll find that even somebody who's been in Bal Vihar for 10, 12 years, when they go to college, they sort of wander away a little bit. When they go to the workplace, they're a little bit distant. Maybe privately in front of parents, they'll still, you know, they'll come for Diwali and they'll do all those things. But publicly, they're not as assertive as the very first generation. Now, this is, a, this is something that in the history of American identity formation, you will find that many communities face this. Jews also face this, so many people. And then they deployed certain methods, which we have to learn. They deployed certain methods to preserve that identity while becoming fully American also, that hyphenated identity. So the identity of an Indian in the United States who is not necessarily so much connected with India per se, because he's second, third, fourth generation. He has to understand the relevance of Sanskriti, the relevance of Sanskriti in his American identity. That is the point that we have to focus on and you know, develop courses, develop, uh, develop uh, ways that young Indians can feel without compromising their Americanness that be, bringing their Hindu Sanskriti is actually an asset. Now, this is where the problem is that the definition of this identity has been given by our opponents. Our opponents have come up with such a lot of caste and oppression of women and human rights problems. They've come up with such a heavy dose of that as part of what it means to be a Hindu in America, that you know it's very embarrassing for a lot of our young people to, un to face it and to accept it, and they sort of distance themselves from this. First they deny it pu publicly, then it becomes part of their own thinking also. So as time goes by, we're losing our own people. So this, so I feel that Sanskrit and Sanskriti, and the advantages of Sanskrit and Sanskrit-based civilization in learning abilities, in mind sciences, cognitive sciences, the history of mathematics, a whole lot of Ayurveda is coming into vogue and the role of Sanskrit and the metaphysics uh, in, in that process. A whole lot of that is extremely relevant for 21st century. So it is not only for the past, it is also for the future. It, uh, the Sanskriti, our Sanskriti offers things for geriatric care. You know, you look at, uh, you look at some of the, the lifespan is expanding physically, but many of the people in their senior years are senile, they don't have mental health, their cognitive skills aren't there. So you, when you look at what all therapies are coming, it's things like mindfulness meditation and yoga and uh, living in communities and multi-generational families wanting to bring them together. A lot of Indian Hindu ways are coming back, coming into the American system, but they are not coming as Hindu. 
they are being sort of digested, reformulated, and some professor here or some medical place there uh, come up with their own different formulation and introduce it as something original. So we have two problems. Many good things are being taken out of our heritage, digested into the American uh, non-Indian framework, either Judeo-Christian or uh, science or something like that, and hence we are losing the nutrients, the positive qualities of our civilization for identity purposes. And many negative things are being injected that you guys are caste oriented and you don't have this or that going on, you're not progressive, you're backward, so forth. So this combined effect of depleting the positives and overburdening with the negatives has a downgrading of identity. This is a very important problem that we have to deal with. Because if we don't deal with the problem of uh, public identity with pride of our young people, you can build all the bhavans, you can do all of that, you will get some people speaking privately, but almost afraid to talk about it publicly. What you really need are Sanskrit speaking kshatriyata. You need kshatriyata also. Sanskrit not only for the so-called the, the traditional idea of a Brahmin job description where you do use it for pujas and you use it for mantra and so on, that is very, very important. But also Sanskrit in terms of your logic to debate, to argue, your, your cognitive skill, your intellectual skill, that kind of a Sanskrit excellence, the excellence that Sanskrit brings is also very important for us to uh, promote. And, uh, I'm hoping that Sanskrit Bharati will, beyond just teaching spoken Sanskrit and getting into the study of Shastras, also lead the way, at some point when it has the resources, lead the way in developing new Smritis for this time and place. We need new Smritis. And Manu himself says that you got to write new Smritis for every time and context and place. So we need American Smritis. We need we need to Sanskritize the United States, in a sense, is what I'm saying. One of the projects I have is called Sanskrit Non-Translatables. If you've seen my book, Being Different, the, big, the biggest chapter in that book is on Sanskrit Non-Translatables. And there I explain why certain words cannot be translated, just cannot be translated because the meaning is vibrational to some extent and the other civilization never had that kind of experience so they don't have a word for it. And I've given 20, 25 examples in that book. And since that book came out, I've developed many more and I'm developing a whole book on this idea of Sanskrit non-translatables, also an e-learning course. So recently I finished uh, 12 episodes of a video course on this theme of Sanskrit non-translatables. And when I go to India in December, I will, I have scheduled about uh, 20, 25 more episodes that I will be recording. So starting in January, uh, on my Facebook channel, uh, one day a week, we will teach you a new non Sanskrit non-translatable word for the whole year. Every, every, so we'll have 52. So the, if we have, once we have 52 of these uh, examples, where we'll explain to you in each case, we'll explain to you this is the Sanskrit word. Here is the common English why it is wrong. What is misleading about it? So for instance, Atman has soul. We'll tell you what is wrong about it. You know, soul, there is no reincarnation for instance. Animals don't have soul. So you cannot really translate. It, it changes the meaning. It distorts. It's a very uh, sort of misleading thing. The first uh, example that I have in my uh, series, this Sanskrit non-translatable, is uh, a famous Indian guru. Uh, I have an eight minute video of his, and he's very, very proudly saying, there is nothing Indian, Vedic or Hindu about Om, nothing special. You can replace it with Amen or Amin. And he's giving many logic and he's laughing, trivializing the whole thing. So I have a discussion, a conversation. I show this clip and then I have a conversation with a real authority in, on Sanskrit who is here now visiting. And we have a detailed discussion on why that is wrong. What is wrong in him, what this guy is saying. 
and that's how we're going to explain every single word. We'll give you an, we'll give you what the wrong translations are, why they are harmful, why they are dangerous, why they are just not correct, how to argue back, how to defend your position. So every week you'll be learning one new Sanskrit word which is non-translatable, which is popularly translated but incorrectly, teach you how to use it correctly. Now, the idea is, Sanskrit Bharati is teaching you to, learn, to speak in Sanskrit. We are not doing that. We're complementing that with something else. We're saying those who speak in English, speak in English, but introduce these Sanskrit words in your vocabulary. If you introduce a new Sanskrit word every week, ultimately we'll be, in my book I have 108 non-translatables, and then when that is out I'll do 1008, so I'm going to Sanskritize English. That is the idea. And then there's another project which is on the history of English etymology. A large percent of English words are originally from Sanskrit anyway. This is also an interesting fact. Dr. Swami mentioned statistics for Indian languages, but through Latin, a large amount of vocabulary from Sanskrit entered the English language. Some important words also. So we need to go back and see that the digest, Sanskrit has been digested into Latin and through that into the European languages long time back and we want to identify that. We want to identify those and we want to then reclaim the Sanskrit words, the Sanskrit roots with proper meaning and proper context and in doing so, we are Sanskritizing the English language. So in one sense, we are saffronizing America. That's what we are. <laughs> if you teach these things to the youth, then there's pride. There's really a lot of pride. Most of the people I address are, in, are college students, young people. And many of them come to me and say, we can't understand our heritage as taught by parents and grandparents. I think we, the grown-ups, have to face, have to take this responsibility that we have to uh, explain in a way that is friendly for the next generation who want to see relevance, they want to see why it matters, why should I bother, I'm not, you know, going back to India, what happens there, why should it, does, should it even affect me, I'm going to live here all my life, and so, we have to come up with very intelligent answers why for them it makes sense. And, uh, and obviously there is such strong arguments in our favor, we need to, we need to package it better. So Sanskrit-based metaphysics, yoga, cognitive science, mind science, meditation, and so on, are so relevant for 21st century America, we have to claim these as our heritage and bring them, bring them back from the mistranslations, because you know when you say mindfulness meditation, that is vipassana. I'm doing a whole book on mindfulness meditation and taking back the mindfulness meditation back into our, into our framework and showing how, <laughs> showing how over the last 40 years, so many people in the United States mainly, some in Europe also, learned these things from gurus, acknowledged it in their early years, then distanced themselves, changed the vocabulary, anglicized it, translated some non-translatables, and started calling it their own. Then some of them put it back and put it into Christianity, as Christian something, and then some of them put it into science, neuroscience, this is a very interesting story, this whole U-turn, how it's working. So I want to bring that out and put all these back into our Sanskriti and into the Sanskrit vernacular. So once you do that, you know, then, then our young people don't have to be embarrassed that we are, you know, we are different. Then we have to be very proud that we are bringing so many assets and so much knowledge uh, into, in, into this culture. My, uh, about um, 20, 25 years ago, uh, when there was a friendly governor in New Jersey 
I think it was less than that, it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. There was a very friendly, Hindu friendly governor in New Jersey who then left. And uh, he uh, wanted to, uh, you know, bring our knowledge, bring our ideas out. So I was called quite often to discuss before school teachers and before, you know, people in general in New Jersey on our heritage and India and all that. Quite often there would be a huge room full of educators, American school teachers. And often I would start by asking the question, why you asked me to come and teach about India to the American students, why should American students want to learn about India? Please tell me. And there would be the silence. This is like around 2000, maybe late 90s. And what I would ask, okay now give me, what is, what is the presence of India in the American uh, life or American history? Uh, somebody would ra raise a hand and say, I, I have seen a hookah. That, that is the idea. That is the idea. This is some kind of weird, you know, exotic thing. Then I would start by saying, you know, when you teach America, you start with Columbus. So why was he landing here? Where, what was he doing? Where was he landing? Where was he going? Why was he trying to do all this? So he was looking for India. And they would think, it's okay, it's just incidental. I said, no, no, it's not incidental. The trade with India was so important for the Europeans. They were all their high value goods for the elite and their medicines, their textiles, a lot of agriculture, steel, all of this was Indian stuff that used to come and for a long, long time. But when the Muslims blockaded, the Ottoman Empire blockaded, they took the territory between Asia and Europe and they blockaded it that. Then these goods were not able to transmit. They had to go through Muslims, traders who could block it, not give it, mark it up 20 times, whatever. So to find a sea route which would bypass the land route controlled by the Muslims was very, very important. And the Queen of Spain was like a venture capitalist in those days, funding journeys to go looking this way, looking that way. So Vasco da Gama took one route around Africa and Columbus taking the other route across Pacific to look for India. This is actually to look for intellectual property in the sense of who will discover the secret trade route to reach India. That person can control the whole marketing of Indian goods. So when you present it like that, they have not thought of it like that. But when you present it with the facts, they believe it because it is true. It is absolutely true that the whole origin of what we call America uh, discovered, so-called discovered by Columbus, it is not discovered because the Native Americans discovered it 20,000 years before. So when the Europeans came, <laughs> so when the Europeans came, the reason they came is because they were thinking they're going to find some route to India. This is very interesting. So when you reposition India in the American education system in a whole different way, not as an apologist saying, oh, you know, please save us from human rights. We are not yet civilized. We will be improve our human rights. Our Indian government has been too apologetic when the report comes. <laughs> you know, China, when they put a report out on human rights, China has its own counter report on American human rights violations. Put it out, say it. India needs, India, we don't have that kind of uh, think tank doing purva paksha, reversing the gaze, re investigating other people. But we need to. You know, many of you might not know that during the, uh, when United States was made in 1776, there were, we all know that there were just original 13 colonies on the East Coast. You know, 90% of what is now USA, that land was not part of the original USA. It was just a small amount of land. So this expansion to the West happened over time. Some of it was, you know, capturing the land from Native Americans, kicking them out. Some was buying from France, the territory of Louisiana, and conquering California from Mexico. They're all kind of different ways. So there was a debate in the US Congress on what should be the, what is the economic merit of expanding to the West, going on expanding to the West, what's the economic merit? This is before uh, gold and oil were discovered in California. Then, of course, they knew there is merit there. So the argument given and a proposal created was that there'll be a railroad 
the, the, a railroad going from the east coast to the west coast. The purpose of which will be to bring goods from India by sea across, across the Pacific, then by train across the United States, and, and compete against the East India Company monopoly of trade with India. This is a very interesting thing. And this train project, which was debated in the US Congress, was called Train to India Project. This is called the Train to India Project. And you can look up in the uh, US uh, Congress records. So India, in the imagination of Americans, was a huge thing all these years. And so, uh, this is a long history, but when we write the history of India, and I know Dr. Swami and I fully agree we have to rewrite the books and we are waiting for the day when the government ministry and all that give us the resources so we can do that project. But when we write the history of India, it's not only the history that happened within the geographical boundary of India as we know it today, but also the history of India that happened in elsewhere in the world, including here. You know, when, in England, when they teach you the history of England, they teach the history of the British Empire, what the British were doing elsewhere. That's part of British history. They're so proud of it. What they were doing in South Africa, in India, in Nigeria, in this, where they, all these kind of places, you know, Australia. Wherever they went, whatever was going on is projected as we bringing our knowledge, our ideas, our language, civilization to all these places. That's part of their history, their sense of who they are. That's why the British are so proud, because they see that. The history of India that took place outside the political boundary of India is far more spectacular than the history of the British Empire. That is true. You will, you will find that in the Southeast Asian countries, Japan, China, Mongolia, Middle East countries, the whole transmission of so much knowledge through the Arabs, Europe, and so forth. This is a huge history of India. So India is a is a, in the in the history of civilizations, world civilizations. India has to be repositioned not only as sort of India, the political entity today, but also Bharatiya civilization as something which is global. This is so when you think big like that, and when you start repositioning things in that way. You can bring the young people on board and then you can convince them that this whole Bharatiya concept and its role in world history in the past and in the, fu the future potential, all of that is based on our Sanskriti and the role of Sanskrit in that is very powerful. So this is the way I would hope that Sanskrit Bharati can kind of reimagine, reimagining Sanskrit and Sanskriti for the American context. That would be a brilliant thing that uh, they are the ones who could, who could do. Uh, I will conclude with that and just hope that uh, this collaboration which we started talking about last night is, a, is an ongoing one that we continue. And I thank you for, for coming and I do want all of you to support Sanskrit Bharati's new project. Dhanyavad. Pralabham sadasam vatsaram dirghamayu Sadamanam bhavati sadayu purujas sadendriya ayushe vendriye pratidishthati Ayushyamaro jamavidhas chobhamanam mahijate Dhanyam dhanam basum bhagavutra labham vatsaram dirghamayu Sita alashpana paradasatru ganumasame dasri ramachandra Bhaktanjaneya Swami Prasada Phalasiddhi Rastu To help me, you can go to the subscribe button on my YouTube and subscribe. We need more subscribers there. Secondly, I get lots of emails on people saying, how do we donate? How can we help you? Uh, you go to rajimalhotra.com or you go to infinityfoundation.com and you can hit the donate button. If you are in a foreign country like in the US or somewhere, you can donate in dollars. There are different ways mentioned. If you want to donate in rupees, there is a column called uh, Infinity Foundation India 
and you click that and there are instructions on how you can donate in India.